and of course, right now we're in this this moment. We know we've been we've been uh, working on on the climate crisis for some time, um, but we're in this really um, sort of unprecedented moment in time in in our society where um, these these connections between racial justice and environmental justice and health justice due to the pandemic um, have really come together. And, and I, I know you have shared some of your thoughts with me on those intersections and wondered if you wanted to share some of your thoughts on, on this particular moment in time with regards to the intersection between racial justice, environmental justice and health justice with our, with our viewers today. I don't think you can separate those three. Whenever you have the kind of institutionalized racism that, that holds back people based upon their color or their gender or their sexual orientation, that's a discrimination that we cannot afford. Several years ago, there was a shooting in, uh, in Missouri and, uh, and I went over there and what was so interesting is that whenever you take any group of people and you disenfranchise them from education, you disenfranchise them from employment, you disenfranchise them from uh, access to uh, uh, some of the amenities of life, and then you put a 110 degree temperature on top of that, you've got a cauldron of violence that's spewing. So consequently, when I look at uh, the climate and the environment, I, look at, I don't just look at the heat, I don't just look at the devastation as far as the climate, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide in the air, I look at all the other etiological factors, education, healthcare, and they're all integrated. So we've got to work collectively with these other forces to to reduce the uh, factors that create the kind of uh, conditions that add to uh, the racism and many of the other isms that hold people back because it's supposed to be a democratic society. And right now, uh, profits over people are devastating uh, that, that uh, posture. And of course, you and many of your civil rights colleagues, you know, we've talked about Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian, uh, your close friends, um, worked so hard, as, you, as you've already said, on the issue of voting rights. Why is it important to you personally that people take the right to vote seriously? Well, as I said, Voting is a democratic process in order to vote, if you want to see something and change something, understanding the political process, whether it's Democratic or Republican, you come together with people, you find common cause, you work it through, you find uh, strategies that do work, and then by voting, you can put it in to put it in the legislative process to change what it is that is not working in your, in your best interest. So that's why it's so important. Uh, we will be telling as we, I counsel right now many of the Black Lives, the young people in this city on Black Lives Matter. And as I said to them, it's one thing to put a large group of people on a street corner uh, with a, with a, from the social areas, but if you don't vote, it won't make a difference. So we've got to talk to them about voting to bring about change for the overall good of the order. So that's why voting is absolutely essential. That's why I'm so pleased with the, uh, the guide that the IPL has sent out talking about how to vote and what to vote for. We've got to teach our churches about the difference in the 501c3 that you're not, uh, uh, you won't advocate your, your, you know, your 501c3 status because you're not telling people who to vote for, but what are the issues and to be sure and get out and vote those issues if we're going to make a difference. Otherwise, uh, it will be business as usual. 